Welcome to the Q&A, the final installment in this amazing Full Metal Alchemist journey, at least for now. Thank you for all the amazing questions. There are a lot of them, so let's just get right to it. Francesca White asks, what character resonated with you the most and why? So as you might expect, it's very difficult to answer this because there are so many great characters. I'm going to give sort of a cop-out answer and give you three, which is the trio of Ed, Al, and Winry. There are different points of inspiration I take from each, and also there's inspiration I take from them together as a trio. Ed, I feel like is somewhat obvious. In a show about throwing yourself out into the world in pursuit of your goal in the process learning and finding your ideals and then holding yourself to those ideals, I feel like Ed is sort of at the top in that regard, partly because of how far he travels. We see him grow up from this kid to an adult, both physically and emotionally and intellectually. What I love about Ed is his grit mixed with his ability to be introspective and to learn. Like he's always learning from his experiences and processing things in new ways and incorporating that into his ideals and even better, adhering to his ideals at any cost, right? Like he's not a phony. The things he comes to, he's really willing to risk everything for those beliefs. And the show does a great job from very early on establishing that the stakes are very real and so to watch Ed struggle through that, to see him be committed to what he believed in, and to see him never wavering from his goals, but still being able to learn and change, while I, as a viewer, was aware that bad things could happen, that was very exciting. Al I love just because of his sweetness, and I feel like Al has a, has a great eye for what's important. Al isn't fooled by arbitrary boundaries and distinctions that other people set for him. One of the best things about Al's character for me is that everyone he meets, he treats them as someone worth talking to, right? Like, Al's always breaking into these really interesting conversations even during battles, like with Kimberly and with the Chimeras and all these things, right? Al just wants to understand. To a large degree, he does understand. You know, like, one of the, the best points of dramatic tension for me is the difference between Al and Ed, how they're both after the same thing. Al obviously wants his body back, and Ed wants Al's body back and his own body back. But for Al, looking at him, it seems clear that he values Ed way more highly, and Ed can't see that because of Ed's own guilt. Al feels like he's sort of there from the beginning. Winry will always have a special place in my heart, firstly because she completely smashed my expectations of what she would be. I thought she would be like just the trope girlfriend or whatever, but she's so much more than that. Some of my favorite moments are with Winry, like the moment with Scar. Winry, you know, as strong as Ed and Al are, I feel like in many ways she's the emotional backbone. I think at some point she internalizes the idea that it's on her to look out for the boys, you know? That is a pretty big decision when you think about it because she's just a kid, but she does it and she does it well and she never complains about it. The only time I remember her, you know, having any difficulty with that is just feeling left out. But she takes on her role willingly and I think that's something we see time and time again from Winry and I think a great representation of that is when she delivers the baby, right? Like everyone's panicking and Winry's like, well, I guess it's on me, you know? And that kind of thing I really love. She has an emotional strength that I think is rare. This might get into some controversial territory even though this is only the first question, but I sometimes feel like femininity is seen as weak. And personally, I don't like that idea. I don't think being strong means being masculine, you know? And I think Winry is a great example of somebody who is feminine and very strong. Like, she's one of the strongest characters, you know? And so I'd say Winry is one of my favorite female characters of all time. I, I think she's really well done and really well written. Michael Stollard asks, which character do you feel you were able to learn the most from? Did your perspective on anything shift over the course of the show? And if so, why? There are so many characters I feel like I picked up something from. So rather than a character, I'll give you a moment. From Ed. It was a moment that I think helped me refine something in a, in a way that was very satisfying to me. And that was the the death of Envy. When Ed points out that the cause of Envy's misery is just that he wants those things for himself. He's jealous of the things that he can never have or feels he can never have. This was really fun to think about because on the one hand, it sort of neutralizes people who are antagonistic or hateful towards me. You know, I feel like usually people don't go out of their way to say negative things or to do negative things or to come at you negatively because of you. It's because something in them is not quite balanced, and so they don't know how to fix what's inside of them, so they come after you, hoping that will restore their own internal emotional balance. And that's such a useful thing to know, because it completely neutralizes the threat. You know, it's like, this is something that you're dealing with. It's just let people ride their own emotional roller coasters. The other and more useful thing for me about this is making it self-directed and looking at my own sins, let's say. Anything that really gets in my head or throws me through a loop. There's, there's an opportunity there to look at something. There's an opportunity to examine a belief or desire or something that's unmet. And so... Looking at it that way, it's sort of a, a roadmap to action, to personal action or personal growth. It's like that's the thing that's calling you that you can actually work on, that you can actually improve. That is a weak point in the chain, and that's such a good way to think about it, I think. It takes what has the potential to be something hurtful and turns it into the potential to be something great, which is learning or personal growth or something like that. And taking that even farther, there's really nothing that can hurt you. You know, if something is true, what's the harm of knowing it? It's strange and this is not how we normally operate, but it's less painful to 
accept a initially painful truth than it is to resist it and hold on to lies and keep that illusion up that everything is the way you thought it was. You know what I mean? That might be very vague, but to summarize, there's nothing about the truth that can threaten you. And so all the things that are causing pain in yourself and others are, are clues. They're signals that something is not right. Something is not aligned in the way that you're thinking about things or the way someone else is thinking about something. So I'd say that was a great moment. I love how collectively in that room, when Envy is, you know, doing that whole whiny speech, everyone just immediately realizes what's going on and the, the veil is just lifted and all the hate is gone and it's just sympathy. Imagine how broadly practical that could be if applied, if everybody was doing that. Just seeing things for what they really were, not being threatened by them. Just seeing things as people's own vulnerabilities. Joe Martin asks, was there a character you wish had a different ending or do you think everything fell in line pretty much perfect? The only complaint I have about this is that Armstrong... Alex Louise Armstrong was not in the epilogue episode. What's up with that? Otherwise, no. I think that all the characters I can think of off the top of my head had a very satisfying resolution. There were no jets that I can think of. I will say that I expected different things. Like, I expected a different ending for Bradley. Although, ultimately, I found his ending quite satisfying, even though it wasn't as grand in scale as I had anticipated. Morgan Ritson asks, Would you say this story is among the best in human history? I would, definitely. I'd say not only is it one of the best all around, I'd say there are a couple of areas in which it's probably... Really, really one of the best, like way up there, like maybe first place. And one of those things is the way they make all the characters feel unique and important. You know, even the, the doctor, the coroner doctor or whatever, has that great moment with his kids. You know, they didn't need to do that, but they did and I appreciate it. And how it's not just the heroes doing everything. The final result is a combination of everybody who's involved coming together and doing their part, doing their best, including the nameless brig soldiers, you know? In a story about the power of humanity and working together collectively towards common ideals, that was a perfect touch, I think. Mimi Ali Kapara asks, which character surprised you the most from your first impression compared to how they ended up in the show? Also, do you have a favorite opening? So definitely Winry, when I think about my expectations versus reality. Like I said before, I think strong female characters are less common. Especially in anime, you know, I feel like I'm sort of geared to expect certain things. But Winry was not that at all. I mean, there was some fan service, but that wasn't the point of her character, right? That was sort of just like an afterthought. It's so funny, right? Because we have these strong characters. We have these powerful alchemists, right? But honestly, one of the strongest people is Winry. And I say that based on her choices. And the fact that she shows up again and again. And the fact that she's willing to shelve her hate and do what she feels is right even though it must be tremendously difficult you know even in a world where people are like watching these shows and calling for the death of every character they don't like winry is an inspiration <laughs> wow i just went back and watched the openings again and uh it, like gave me such a good feeling i don't know the names of the openings but i'd say it's a toss-up between the first opening just because of the the feeling of starting the show and Entering this dark world, like, it gave me a thrill listening to that opening. And then the fourth opening. The one that goes, na 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 That one I love. Nick asks, what was your favorite arc and favorite character aside from Armstrong? <laughs> Will you be listening to the soundtrack? Can I cheat and say the, the final arc? I mean, can't get any better than that, right? I'd say the final arc and also the, the beginning arc. Getting everything set up was very exciting. Before I started the show, I got lots of warnings about how the beginning of the show sort of rushes through things because they assume a lot of people have already seen the 2003 anime. And I have no reference point to compare between the two, but I can say that I love that pacing. I love the beginning of the show. There's just so much that happens. It's so dramatic. You get the whole world and you get the Elric brother's backstory and you get one is all all is one all of that so quickly the beginning of it is riveting i think and yes i will be listening to the soundtrack tim lawrence asks i'd like to know your opinion on the comparisons they have on the ishfallen order of extermination to world war ii i'm not knowledgeable enough about history to make a very nuanced point about this but there are obviously some very big parallels at least in a very general sense i wasn't thinking about it too much in terms of history i was thinking about it more in terms of just human acts the show i think is largely an exploration of humanity and i think that it takes you deep into the darkness and then sort of challenges its to get out of it and to challenge the assumption that this is all there is, right? This is what humanity is, these dark, vile, sinful creatures. So I think that choosing something like the Ishvalan War of Extermination was a very brave way of going all the way there into the worst human abysses and creating that as sort of a baseline and then have the characters shoulder burdens to try to improve this hopeless world that they seem to be living in. Paul asks, <laughs> what is truth? Oof. So I think for most of the show, while I was watching it, I thought truth was a being. I have sort of leaned away from that idea. I don't think truth is a being. I don't think there actually is any kind of God figure in any meaningful way. I think what the characters are seeing is mostly from within themselves. And of course, you know, the things they're seeing, even if it is just themselves, is an element of God, right? It's an element of the universe. It's an element of truth. But they will never get the complete version. Like, they're never going to be able to talk to the ultimate full God. So what it must be is it's a reflection of God through their human lens. It's a reflection of universal law 
to the best of their understanding. That's why I think all the portals look different. That's why I think the truth treats them differently based on who they are and what they've done. That is also maybe partly why there's always sacrifice involved in getting there because that is just how that works. You know, there is no growth. There is no change. There is no deep knowledge without sacrificing something. And oftentimes growing as a person means sacrificing the things you think you know. You know what I mean? Or sacrificing the things you think are indispensable when really they're not. Benjamin Mayhew asks, would you ever consider watching the first series? So I'm definitely going to watch it. It's just a matter of when and if I'm going to do videos on it. I'm not planning on doing that right now, but I think at the very least I could definitely make a video after I finish the series comparing the two. I think that would be interesting. Super Nico 95 asks, which character would you have wished to have gotten more from? Madam Christmas. <laughs> no, I mean, I really don't have an answer to this question just because this show is the epitome of using characters well. What was your favorite use of alchemy or favorite action scene? So I'll give a different answer for each. Favorite use of alchemy was definitely the Al Kimbley fight. I thought that was amazing. Favorite action scene is probably going to be Bradley taking on the tank. That is just engraved in my in my brain in my retinas partly because i made that ending screen with bradley against uh vulcan raven from metal gear solid <laughs> it's just so cool something about like the fact that he takes on the tank while wearing that white collared shirt he's like the ultimate dad soldier you know what i mean there's just something so beautiful about it how does full metal alchemist brotherhood compare to all the anime you've watched previously like gto and evangelion it's one of my favorite anime i'd say at this point i'd say it's one of the most uplifting in terms of shows that actually explores like, you know, the full range of themes, GTO is sort of a comedy, right? It does more than most and it left me feeling better than most. And also, and this might be just because I'm older now and because I'm focusing on shows more consciously these days as a result of these videos, but I feel like there's just a lot more there. Like each episode contains something interesting for me to look at and talk about. And so there was this whole range of human experience and character drama and personal development and all these things that are in there. It's just jam-packed, where I think a lot of other anime that I've seen have less notes, you know, have less range, let's say. Dempsey asks, are there any plot points or characters you think could have been better executed? So the only character weirdness I have, I think, is with Mei Chang. Her character is fine, but something about her aesthetic, it felt discordant. I think it's the fact that her age was sort of ambiguous to me. So it seems like she's this five-year-old kid, like, hanging with the adults and it's sort of like, that doesn't fit in this dark world, you know? That's how I felt when I first saw her. But I think that's less of a character or writing problem and more of just an aesthetic choice that they made. As for plot points, I can't really put my finger on this, but I think one mistake I made or one thing I didn't do as well as I would have liked to have done in this reaction series was I think I overfocused on the plot events and the details of the, the world and, and alchemy and the plan and everything. Like, what is father's origin and what is father's plan? Ultimately, it didn't matter as much as I thought it would matter. Because really, it's about the characters, right? And so while I like the creativity that comes from alchemy and I like the world and there's a lot of potential there, I found myself sort of tuning out from the, the nitty gritty details of it towards the end. Because for some reason, it didn't hit me as being like really impactful. I think the most interesting world element is the one is all, all is one, the idea of equivalent exchange and the interactions with the truth. But then like father's plan and the circles and all that stuff, it's really cool, but it just, it didn't have the same level of meaning for me that some of the other things did. Also, and this is on me for not really having an answer. It might be there. Did we ever answer the question, what is the value of the human soul? I was thinking about that the whole series and I never could really come to anything conclusive about that. I mean, is it that it's invaluable? Or maybe it's sufficient to say that it's worth something, that it's not worthless. Oh, and I'm not going to be purchasing the Nina Alexander Fusion Dance t-shirt. No, thank you. I don't need any reminders of that. Safwan Sanim asks, did you enjoy the ensemble style approach of this story or do you prefer more localized stories with a core group? Both are great as long as the characters are done well and the two shows that you <laughs> listed as examples, hard to think of better, better ones. I feel like each of them exemplified that storytelling format in really the best way. I mean, The Last Airbender has an ensemble cast in its way. It's not as focused on as much as this show, right? I think before the show or just, you know, speaking very generally, I would prefer shows like The Last Airbender with a core group, but Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood managed to do it so well that I really can't vote against it. Zavula asks, if there was ever a sequel series, what might you hope to see in it? The Adventures of Alex Louise Armstrong. <laughs> with his respectable muscles, would you ever open your own portal of truth? Well, given where my thoughts about the portal of truth are now, I would say that in a way I, I do open my own portal of truth. I'm always trying to get closer to things I feel complement my life. And one of the best tools for that, I think, is looking for things that I'm carrying that are inessential, that are based on a mistaken way of thinking, likely from childhood or likely from a much younger time in my life, you know, where I was trying to survive. And in order to survive, I fixated on something or I developed sort of like a, a guideline for action that got me through, that did help me survive like it was supposed to, but was incomplete. 
you know, like in a way it was a paper map of the world. But the good news about growing up, you know, is that you get to go back with your adult brain and sort of strip those away and put more substantial things there. You know, it's funny, the things you think about, the ideas you carry with you, they always feel true, right? But I think that's sort of an illusion, that just because something feels true, it is true. I think we overestimate our ability to measure the accuracy of our own thoughts which is sort of terrifying, right? But like I said before, it's also great because once you realize that it gives you a little bit more flexibility to mold yourself and take away the things that are, you know, that have been supporting you for a long time that are not wholesome, that are not the full truth, they're not healthy. And so I'm always looking, I'm always digging. I'm always willing, or I always aspire to be willing to let go of the things that are not essential or not really me or not conducive to being the, the things that I aspire to in my highest ideals. And it does feel like an exchange. It does feel like you have to give to get. You know, you have to give something away to get something better. You gotta let go of something that you are to be something that you could be, if that makes sense. I don't know how related that actually is to the portal of truth, but it's just what comes to mind. Kim Sa asks, which sin do you relate to the most and which one do you think is the best designed one? On a light note, I would like to say sloth. I mean, I'm very hardworking, but I think that that tendency is born from an innate problem I have, which is that I'm very lazy and I had to push myself to not be slothful. Like I spent a lot of time as a kid, like bored, sort of meandering around life, being purposeless, not being driven, afraid to have goals. Now I'm sort of the opposite of that to a fault. But I think that that partly is born from a fear of something I know about myself, which is I have that tendency. But then on a more existentially interesting level, greed probably, because I want, I really want, <laughs> I want a lot. But one thing I love about greed in the show that I think is very real for me is that greed has the capacity to be something problematic in your life, but it's also one of the best things in your life to push you out and actually make you better and to find the things that you actually need and to go on that journey like greed went on and like all the characters went on. In fact, I think a lot of the characters are driven by their greed. You know, look at Ed, right? Ed is driven by a very strong obsessive desire, but he needs to start there to begin the journey to become the Ed he is at the end of the show. And that's how I feel about a lot of my life. You know, I feel like I've had a lot of desires and the desires were never really ultimately the thing. You know, like in the situations where I've been fortunate enough to accomplish the things that I, I wanted to accomplish, the thing in itself that I get, it's not satisfying in the way that you hope or expect, but the act of getting there always tears you apart in the best of ways in that you're challenged so much that you're forced to adapt and to grow and to change and to learn. So I'd say greed is sort of a central point in my life that I kind of lean into. You know, like I go for the things that I want because I, I treat it as radar. I treat it as radar for something that I probably need to focus on to get to the next level of my life. Also, I think it would be funny if you were to speculate how the original anime decided to change the story. I mean, there's so many ways I think it can go, but one thing I can imagine happening, and I actually think I've seen this in comments, is that I can see them making it a lot darker, just because the tone of the beginning of Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood is way, way darker than I think the ending of the show because they start you off in that terrible place and then build you out of it. That's the whole point. But I can imagine if you're coming into the story and you only have that beginning to work with, you're gonna maybe stretch that out through the whole thing. Norrin Rad says, it is my contention that Trisha Elric is the MVP and the reason humanity is saved. What is Trisha's role in the story and her impact on her family? Absolutely. I mean, she's very central to a lot of things. I'm sure that I'll understand her role even more, you know, after a rewatch, like you said. But just the fact that she gave Hohenheim something to care about, a reason to live or a reason to fight back against father, a way to embrace his humanity, but also raising Ed and Al to be great kids. And then I guess just, you know, accidentally her death being the, the cause of Ed trying human transmutation. There's a lot. I don't know if I can say that she would be the ultimate MVP just because there's just so many. I feel like there are probably a lot of characters in the show where if you were to remove them, the story ends in disaster. Because I think that's part of the point of the story is that it's not just one individual's actions. It's humanity. It's a minority of people for sure, but it's their striving for their ideals. And the impact that has on others as well as their care for others and others care for them that leads them to have that unified strength that allows them to save the world. Kate Carter asks, which is your favorite style of alchemy? And if you could choose one, which would you want? I don't think they ever mentioned this more than once, but wasn't Alex Louise Armstrong's alchemy called artistic alchemy? I just like the sound of that. I don't think I would want explosion or fire alchemy just because the sole purpose of it is destruction and I would rather be able to use it, you know, for more things in my life, for more constructive purposes. Ed's alchemy is great. I know that's a cliche answer again, but... Like, it's hard hard to not want to do what he's able to do. He and Al, right? They can fix things. They can make things better. But they can also fight, right? It's like they have the full range. Aura Y asks, How do you feel about Roy's decision to use the Philosopher's Stone to restore his vision? Mm. I am against it. 
as a person, but I like it in the show. I'm sort of with Ed on this that I think the values are more important than the result. One reason I feel this way is because I think once you start going down that road that, you know, I'm a good person, so I can also do these bad things, you end up in a lot of trouble because you, you start to be able to justify anything. And I feel like it's a race to the bottom because now you're justifying things that you know to be wrong. And then your enemy, who also feels justified, can do the same things or worse things to justify them defeating you, etc. And so there's like this cyclical element to it. I think that if you really want things to improve in the world, you, you stick to what you feel is right and you accept the consequences of that because it's the only way things change. And I think that's one of the things I love about Ed's philosophy is he's sort of transcendent in that way. It's not about winning, right? It's about doing what's right. And if enough people were like Ed, the results would be great. That being said, I love that they do that in the show because it allows for multiple points of view. Like what I just said is just my opinion and maybe Ed's opinion, but I don't know if I'm right. That in some way is a very simplistic way of looking at things and a very easy thing to grandstand about. It's much harder to live. And so I like the way the show allows for different characters with different beliefs to also be successful in the world because it's going to be a combination of all those things. It seemed as if Ling and Greed had come to understand one another in the end. Do you think there could have been a world where some of the homunculi could have coexisted still? Yeah, I think that the ultimate assessment of homunculi is that they're human or they have the capacity to be human. I think the best evidence of this is Greed. Greed is a pure homunculus, right? But he's able to make his own choices. So I think that if circumstances had been different, some of the homunculi could have rehabilitated and lived good lives, but it would have been very easy. I think a lot of them were sort of at this point of not no return, but very difficult return. Armani Lavelle asks, how do you think the show would have been affected if it was in present day? Phones, planes, computers, the whole nine yards. I feel like it's probably a good thing that father did not have access to transportation or modern tools because I'm imagining how big the alchemical circles could have been. Some of the stuff I think they have though, right? They have phones, although not cell phones. I don't think it really would have affected anything core to the story and what makes it special because it's all about the characters. And anyway, alchemy is sort of cooler than what we have. Rumoristo asks your least favorite character besides Yoki. <laughs> the first answer that comes to mind is Gerso just because of that terrible noise he makes, but he's a good character though. Characters I don't like on a personal level, the gold tooth doctor, don't like that guy. Oh, Show Tucker is top for like who I dislike. As for judging them as characters in a story, draw a blank. <laughs> You're asking about the worst element of probably the show's best feature, so it's tough. Even Yoki, you know, like Yoki works well as being Yoki. Like that's his point. He's the punching bag and it's great. And his scene where he hits pride is a huge payoff for that. Even the characters that feel really simple and not nuanced are great and are probably done that way deliberately. Like I'm thinking of the generals, right? The central generals. They're all these really basic kind of cardboard cutouts, but that's by design. The gold tooth doctor even says that, right? It's like, what do you expect from people who we were able to lure in with the promise of immortality? They selected for those simpletons. So in a way it's perfect. Isaac Murray asks, do you think Ed still has the ability to use the new skills he's learning about in the West? I believe that Ed can do whatever he sets his mind to. Ultimately, I think that's one of his skills. Even if he never does alchemy again in his life and never learns alchemy, he'll be able to utilize the things he learns quite well. He'll never be out of tools, that guy. Adam Dyer asks, if there was anything in this show you could change however you wanted, what would it be? Something I just thought of is, I think it would have been cool if Father had a more clear arc. The Dwarf in the Flask starts out as something not evil. I think the things he says to Hohenheim are reasonable and are set out of care. And he actually does help Hohenheim begin his journey, right? Somewhere along the way it goes wrong and he starts wanting it all. And I think probably, if I had to guess, that is from the desire to be free and a misunderstanding of what freedom really is. Because freedom is not living outside of existence or what you are. Freedom is fully being that, fully being what you are and having mastery over it. You maybe can say that freedom is being nothing except what you truly are. I actually relate to Father quite a bit. You know, because freedom is actually one of my stated desires and has been for a long time. Like, I want to be free from obligations, free from pressure, having the freedom of location, having the freedom to spend my time how I want. And those goals have been good for me in pushing me out. But one thing I've learned on that path is that there is no freedom that way. I mean, as long as I allow my freedom to be defined by external things, it's not solid. True freedom can only ever come from my perspective. And in that way, I'm already as free as I ever will be. And so Father is endlessly seeking this desired state, but it's based on a mistaken belief that he can ever get anywhere that way. And in the process, he discards some of the most precious things that he has. But that's just my reading of Father. And I think it would have been fun to see that explored a little bit more concretely. He's sort of a mystery to me still, in some ways. And there's a question for me of why knowledge? You know, why knowledge as the way out of what he sees as a terrible state? You're being turned into a human-based homunculus. Which of the seven sins would you most want to share a body with and why? So based on just the physicality, I'd say envy. Because I think the ability to shapeshift and do what envy can do with his body is pretty cool and would come in really handy. In terms of the sin, I would go with greed. 
for reasons I've said, you know, like I think greed is actually one of the, the more positive sins if utilized correctly. Benja asks, if you could choose to be an avatar bender, only one element, or a powerful trained state alchemist, which would you go with? I'm going to go with alchemy just because of the range. I would like to have the diversity of skills. And I would also prefer not to be reliant on one element. Suzanne Cunningham asks, if you could go back in time and pitch this show to your past self, what would you say? I would say, imagine a show that goes as far into human darkness as arguably any other show and then asks the question, can humanity be redeemed by giving a huge cast of characters varying beliefs ideals and convictions and letting it all play out in the world while exploring the philosophy of the universe. <laughs> Daniel Velasquez asks, who is the best girl and why is it Madam Christmas? It's Madam Christmas because it was Madam Christmas the whole time. Soren Monroe asks, how would you sum up the show in one sentence to me? What is the value of a human soul? <laughs> I still don't know. Christy K asks, would you recommend any books or films with similar themes to Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood? Well, definitely The Last Airbender in the very rare chance that somebody watching this video hasn't seen that. Really, I think that there are a lot. You know, I think that anything that is this kind of long journey of a hero is going to have similar elements or the same elements because I really think they are a map for life and there is an answer. There is an answer to how to live. I mean, it's not a perfect answer and there are definitely shades of gray in it, but the overall arc, I think, of shows like this, of the hero's journey and of Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood and the assessment they make is correct. And that is something like everyone lives in ignorance to some degree, but there are things that show up at your doorstep, so to speak, whether it be a person or it be a problem, or it be pain, or whatever it is that contains inside of it a call to action, or something that should be explored. And the desire is often to ignore it, to stay in safety. But the call is there, and the longer you ignore the call, the greater detriment to yourself. But then the people who first recognize the challenge and then take on the challenge go out into the world with the wrong idea of what that means, with the wrong idea of what the goal is, or what the whole point of it is, or what challenges they'll face. In the process, they meet the world, and the world kind of whittles them down. They are faced with a choice to crumble and collapse into the darkness, or to find the ideals that will carry them through. And in doing so, they become realized versions of themselves, one, and to inspire others and then ultimately end up benefiting both themselves and others around them by their inspiration. That's the story of The Last Airbender, right? Aang runs away from his duties, but he can't ignore it. That's something that is facing him. It's a challenge that's facing him. It's pain that's calling him. And so he goes out into the world not understanding what it means to be the Avatar and not knowing who he is. And through a combination of his own journeying and his own insights into the world and his own experiences and the people he meets along the way, he ends up becoming not only the best version of himself, but also the person who ends up making things better for others. In Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, you got Ed and Al, who have, you know, a pretty tragic origin story, and live in a very dark world, and set out into it with a goal that is incomplete and sort of unhealthy in the way they approach it. But through their experiences, through meeting the people they meet and seeing what they see, they refine their ideals and become men, basically. And the act of them being the things they want to see in the world shapes the world. And a lot of other characters in Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood are doing that at the same time. And it's the combination of all those people together that allows them to, in a sense, redeem humanity, or to prevent a total slippage into the darkest abysses of of humanity and nihilism and hatred and disgust. It's through them stepping out into the world and putting those burdens on their shoulders and rising to the challenge and not losing sight that allows for humanity to actually be useful and be special and be meaningful. That really is the story. You know, it's not the only story, but it's it's the story for big shows like this or big movies like this. So really anything in that genre, I guess the question is more just like, what does that very well and what does that honestly? And I think the point of watching these kinds of things is to observe that process and then to then try to live that process. Like, it's not like Gandalf shows up at your house and is like, let's go, we're going to throw the ring into Mordor or whatever. It's more like you have a problem or you have something that is bothering you at an existential level. That is your call to action. You seek to address that and you see where that takes you and you like try to be courageous in the face of it and try not to let it corrupt you. RMD Victor asks, will you read the manga? So I actually have never read manga. I mean, I've read like the odd single book. I've never like followed a series. In the past, I've had a hard time connecting with comics or visual media like that, both Western and Eastern. Salinger asks, what was your favorite scene or moment of the show? I could not pick just one, so I'll just throw out a bunch of them. The gun scene with Winry and Let It All Out, Bradley's tank fight, the human transmutation of Ed and Al's mother, even though it's horrific, it's, it's just really unique and amazing. The Armstrong Sig tag team, Envy's final scene, Kimberly's return, the whole epilogue, <laughs> and getting Al's body back. There's just so, so many. I know I'm going to watch this later and think of like a thousand more. The whole show is just filled with great moments. Jaffa Diaz asks, most underrated character in the show. Trisha is maybe a good candidate. I don't really know what other people think about the characters, so it's hard for me to evaluate this. One character that 
at first seemed like a minor character that I grew to love was Dr. Marco. I mean, I think Dr. Marco plays a pretty significant role in the show, and I love his arc as well. Nubao Fauer Zug asks, what are your thoughts on Bradley's humanity possibly being tied to the fact that his body was never taken over by a homunculus? I think no matter what the reasons for Bradley having the conclusion he has, where he, he seems to kind of accept his humanity and appreciate humanity, it's clear that it was possible to do that as a homunculus because we've seen greed do it. And I think it's also implied that pride has some goodness in him and that Envy has a lot of humanity even though he never was able to come back from the state he was he was in. So I think the fact that it's ambiguous is okay. I think we still have enough to go on in the judgment about like, what are the homunculi? And you know, one of the biggest reasons is that the homunculi are father and father is very human. Ramon Cintron asks, what is your opinion on Bradley's wife towards the end of the show? Yeah, she proves herself to be really strong. You don't really get that impression of her at first, right? But she seems to know a lot about the truth by the end of the show and she seems to be coping with it really well. She also is another character who shoulders her responsibilities, right? She decides to raise pride even knowing the danger. You gotta wonder, you know, on some cynical level, how much she knew before then. Probably nothing, but I guess it's possible that she knew more than she let on. This is Full Metal Alchemist after all, right? Where there's always layers and there's always chess games being played. Samuel D. Baum asks, do you think the dwarf in a flask got dealt a bad hand? Was he ever capable of understanding humanity? As I mentioned, I think this is one of the things I would have liked to have seen more of. I would have liked to have seen this been explored more fully. I think that judging by some of the themes of the show, that he had a chance. I think everybody has a chance. The homunculi show signs of being redeemable, even though most of them aren't. So I think it was possible, I just think that he got carried away. I think he represents the capacity in humans to fall into those sins deeply, or to live in a state of disdain for others, or disdain for the world, or a sense of nihilism, or the sense that one knows better than others, right, the pride thing. The belief that you can see things more clearly and everyone else is stupid. The desire to be better than others carries in it an incorrect judgment of what others are, you know? I think that is just sort of his role. Logan Bradford asks, who has the best character arc and why is it Hohenheim? Well, it's Hohenheim. The thing is, I think even though we focus a lot on Ed and Al and, you know, a lot of the characters, this is one of those cases where the true battle is sort of older, and uncovered throughout the story. This is an old battle between Hohenheim and Father, who are sort of two halves in many ways. And so Hohenheim's arc is epic and great. I think I have to watch the show again to fully appreciate it. I just get that sense because I think there, there's a lot of Hohenheim early on or towards the middle maybe that only makes sense once you have full context on the show. So I'm leaving that space for myself to say that later. Where I am now, based on my experience, I'd say my favorite arc was Ed. Blake Castix asks, why do you think Mustang used a Philosopher's Stone to heal his eyesight instead of giving up his alchemy like Ed did? I think that Mustang represents a different mode of thought than Ed. Roy Mustang is more of a pragmatist. You know, I actually started to talk about this in the finale, but I didn't ultimately get to go into it. My gut sense is that there are going to be continued government problems, and the reason I think that is because a lot of it is based on lies. The public never got the true story. So it's more spin, right? It's more politicking. And so I feel like that creates the next crisis. That's the impurity that still exists in the system. That's people not recognizing high ideals. And this is reading way into it, but I actually think that the prologue is referencing that when they say that one journey ends, but it's never truly over. This show is all about cycles, right? So I think that the journey is not over for Roy. I think that Ed and Al are more complete, more realized. I think they've sort of done their arc. I think Roy completed an arc, but he still has more arcs to go. There are still really serious arcs for him and the other people involved in the, the governance of Amestris. Cosmotron asks, what are some of the relationships you enjoyed the most? Like you, I also think it's Ed, Alan, Winry. I think that the three are meant to be a trio. I don't think there's any one of them without the other two. Davy asks, how did the fact that there were technically no seasons dividing up the show affect your viewing experience? Did you enjoy the pace of the show overall? I didn't think about it at all. I don't think it had any negative effect. It's interesting though, because I'm still sort of aware of arcs. You know, even though they weren't demarcated, you can sort of feel where an arc ends and another one begins. But overall, I don't think it really affected me that much. And the pace of the show, I think that there were moments where it dragged, but overall, I think the pacing was excellent. Alice1510 asks, do you have a theory on how the Xerxian alchemists made the dwarf in the flask? And do you believe every person has their own portal of truth? So I don't really have any theories on the dwarf in the flask. That was something I was looking forward to, but I think that it's not really that important ultimately. To me, the takeaway is just that, well, he's created by humans. He comes from Hohenheim, who's human. He represents darker elements of humanity and darker outlooks on humanity. It just occurred to me actually that maybe his desire for knowledge is an extension of him being born out of a desire of others for knowledge. It's conceivable and seems somewhat likely that the people who are trying to make him were aiming for the same things father later aimed for, which is like power above humanity. So that's just a small thing to throw out there. As for the portal of truth, I think that everybody has their own portal of truth, but 
there are going to be parameters on the limitations of what that is, just based on what humans are and what experience is and what the universe is. So they're all going to be reflective of one's life, and in that way they're going to be similar. But because I now think that the portal of truth is just a reflection of the universe through that person, it's going to be the same universe but colored differently by the person, if that makes sense. Square asks, in the last episode, Father meets truth and is berated for trying to achieve perfection by removing his seven sins and thinking it makes him above other humans. Father demands to know what he should have done and truth doesn't answer. What do you think is the correct way to pursue perfection? And how can you achieve something like that without getting rid of the things that make you flawed? Hmm. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is that anything resembling perfection has to be the truth, right? There's an arrogance to the thought that what is, is imperfect. I mean, just think about that scene, right? Like he's looking at something that at least in, on some level resembles God and he's telling God that the way he is isn't good enough. Imagine telling God that God messed up and that you have taken it upon yourself to remove God's mistakes, you know? There's definitely something off about that. And this is something real, I think. We can't understand the full complexity of the way things are in existence. And so it's very easy to evaluate what is based on a perfect notion or an ideal of something. But on some level, those things are always going to be disconnected from reality, you know, because everything is connected. There's there's a very good reason why things are the way they are. And those things are very deeply rooted in just the laws and nature of the universe itself. So who is anybody to take a look at the world and assume they understand it well enough to judge it. There's no possible way for any human being to understand the full complexity of, of existence and why things are the way they are. This might sound weird and counterintuitive, but on some level things already are perfect. So thinking you can do better than that, you're going to go wrong somewhere. You're missing something. But that creates a problem, right? Because if that's the case, then everything's great the way it is and we should never do anything. But that's not what I'm saying. I think that the key is to try to be as most aligned with what you actually are you know, with what humanity actually is and to, as I said earlier, strip away the things that are, are illusions and try to get to the core of just life. You do have autonomy in life and I think part of that is because the universe wants you to have autonomy in life. Like the fact that it is means that there's something there. There's something valuable about it. One thing I think I talked about a bunch in the show is the idea of like a universal will and it's not the kind of universal will I always used to think about where there's like, you know, some human-like being sort of pointing fingers and making things happen, it's more like there are just laws in place. There's just a basic structure, and that basic structure creates a chain of things happening, and based on that chain of events, you can attribute something like value, like desire, even though it's not exactly what we usually think of in those terms. And so one way I think you live well is by trying to maximally align yourself with the potential that the universe gives you. And that's a whole bunch of things, right? That's like eliminating things that are, are wrong, eliminating things that are not truth, eliminating beliefs that in their application lead to the destruction or loss of that potential. I know I'm reaching way out there, but if we're talking about the universe having something like desire and having a path. You don't want to run counter to that force. You want to see what that is, see what you are, and then use that optimally to be the creative force or the, the creation of potential or someone whose values, when applied, create a harmonious state for whatever those desires or values are from the universe so that you're sort of harmonious with it. And so I think that's one of the reasons why the ideals are so important in this show. You know, the, the ideals about the the potential of humanity and the preciousness of humanity and the taking responsibility for one's role in the universe willingly, with eyes open, fully engaging with that life, having concern for others, having respect for what exists, you know, seeking understanding, real understanding. All of those things make the characters harmonious with their own existence. This is really hard to explain. I know this probably sounds nuts, but I think if you recognize the connectedness of things and you recognize the fact that humans were not created in a vacuum, that we exist as part of a massive system that we'll never fully understand, then the question becomes, okay, so what does it mean to be the best part of that system I can be? And I think that is the exact question that these shows are trying to answer. These shows are all tests of ideals to see what works and what doesn't work and where things lead. And while I don't think we'll ever be able to pin those things down with 100% accuracy, I think we have enough knowledge of it generally that we actually could live that way. The challenge is just doing it. The challenge is just applying it. On some practical level, we all sort of know what, what that looks like. We all know what's right. We all know when we're doing something wrong, you know, basically. You can argue that there's a cultural element to it, but then you got to ask yourself, like, well, where do cultural values come from? And why do most cultures share very, very similar things? You know, there's, there is something like a universal human value, I believe. And so I think perfection, even though I don't think that's the best word for it is about slipping into that as perfectly as possible. And evil would be not appreciating it, being disconnected from it, or trying to destroy it. The Bird of Hermes asks, Kimberly, the best character or the best character? Maybe the best villain, I'd say. He's awesome. 
that last scene really cinched it for me, I think. Scott McKennedy asks, do you also believe Risa and Roy are canon? I don't see any reason why not. It definitely seems like there's something romantic between them. Who's Roy gonna choose instead of Risa? Some girl at the bar? Well, it's possible. Possible. They've been through too much. Yusuf asks, who would you pick to be your girlfriend? Winry, Krista, Historia, or Katara? Winry, Winry, a thousand times Winry. <laughs> Winry is sort of my ideal in many ways. She's strong but feminine, as I said. She's also talented. I love girls who are talented. I'm very attracted to girls who have skills and passions. It's something that I love. In people in general, but that extends to romantic partners. I like people who feel alive and connected to the world, you know, and Winry feels like that kind of person. Katara also is, but Katara has a personality that... I would clash with. We would fight constantly, and I'm not looking for that. <laughs> Suzami asks, how would you compare Scar and Zuko's villain to hero character development? That is a great comparison. I would say that Scar goes a little bit deeper into the darkness before getting pulled out, right? Like Zuko, we, we come to learn he's just sort of an innocent kid. I don't think he really does anything totally wrong, but Scar kills, you know, so there is a larger hill to climb, although that is probably just a function of the target audiences, right? I would say Zuko is a little bit more relatable for me than Scar just because I feel like Scar's tragedy is very specific to him and something that I'm very thankful not to have experienced, whereas Zuko, even though he's experienced a lot of trauma in his life, there are things about it that I feel are more relatable to me, like, for example, his relationship with Ozai, it's extreme, and he's the prince, right, but at the root of it, it's family drama. It's having expectations placed on you, it's trying to find your role in the world. Scar, I think, is a little bit more about ending cycles, ending the cycle of tragedy, rising above people who have wronged you, taking your rage and your desire for revenge and channeling it productively, which is great, and I especially love the the metaphor with the arms, you know, the destruction and reconstruction. That's such an awesome moment for, for Scar. But Zuko's arc, I think, is a little bit more relevant to my life, thankfully. One thing I like about both of them is not only do they come to terms with things emotionally, but then they go back and fix the things that started the problem in the first place, right? Like, Zuko sort of heals from his, his pain, but then he also becomes the Fire Lord, right? It's like both. Scar too, right? Like, Scar gets over his rage, but he also goes back and makes a mistress better, makes the world better. And that is something I love. I love it when there's that tandem journey of, like, introspection and internal growth and using that to actually affect meaningful change. Mini Money asks, since Ed's main goal was to retrieve Al's body, what do you think he would have turned out if he never managed to attach Al's soul into that armor? I think that had Ed lost Al in that childhood scene, that would probably have been it for him. I don't really see him recovering from that. He had a lot of guilt about it as it was with Al being there but in a suit of armor. Imagine if Al was just gone. I don't think he would have given up. I mean, I think he would have used that as motivation to take action and try to find a solution. And so there's a chance that a similar journey would have happened where that pushed him out into his life and he learned the things he needed to learn to be successful and a good person. But I think there's a much greater danger that he just lives in darkness and, and never has any realizations and pushes people away and just hates himself and becomes something more villainous. Quaid Hudson asks, Darius, Henkel, Gerso, or Zampano? Not Gerso. I'm gonna go Henkel. Because of the Al scene. Joey Joseph Jojoson wants to play Mary Bankill. Bradley Kimbley Truth. <laughs> um, so you're just not going to give me any female options. All right, that's fine. Damn, this is hard. <laughs> this is the hardest question so far. <laughs> you marry Bradley. Marry Bradley. He has proven himself to be a good husband. You bang the truth. <laughs> because why not? That would be an experience. And you kill Kimbley. I don't want to kill Kimbley, but... Gotta. Lockwood asks, do you have any thoughts on God, the thing that looked like a blank white version of what it was talking to? Do you think it has a moral compass and decided Ed's answer was right itself? Or is it getting that from somewhere else? I don't think the characters are actually talking to God, as I mentioned earlier. I think they're talking to maybe something that is a reflection of God, but it's just like a, like a little sliver of it. It's just like what their brain can comprehend of it. Which, when you think about it, is what we do when we think about things, right? Like, when we think about anything, what we're doing is we're interacting with a tiny sliver of the all, right? And so everything we interact with or every thought we have is a combination of who we are and what the external realities of the universe are. And so I think it's going to be a combination of that. And I think what happened with Ed at the end is that he made a realization that was most in acceptance of the all, that was most harmonious with the all, which included being willing to sacrifice, having a high ideal that matches the goals of nature with humanity, even though that might sound like a very abstract idea. He became a version of himself that was fully realized in his ideas and harmonious with the world, if that makes sense. Asher Elite asks, are there any parallels that stuck with you between The Last Airbender and Full Metal Alchemist? Such as Zuko and Mustang. Interesting, another Zuko comparison. I wasn't actively thinking about it, even though I was watching both shows simultaneously. I think that there's a broader parallel that exists in just all of these stories, which is the journey of self-discovery through values and through action. More specifically, you have the tragedy, right? Like, you have a world of tragedy. 
And then you have characters going out into that tragedy and not letting it crush them and learning who they are, but then also fixing the tragedy and sort of like the ultimate culmination of humanity. Another parallel that I like is that the characters are allowed to be flawed. That's one of my favorite things about The Last Airbender, and it's also true in Full Metal Alchemist. Everybody's got their things, right? Everyone's got their stuff, but that doesn't stop them. That doesn't stop them from growing and it doesn't stop them from doing great things. And they're always improving. Winry and Katara, I think, are actually a really good parallel, just because while Winry's not as active on the journey as Katara is, they both seem to be the emotional backbone of the, the young crew, you know? Then you have the Eclipse, you have the fact that firebending can consume you. There's just so much, like, from start to finish, basically. Dominic says, rank the homunculi. So I'll rank them in terms of my least favorite to favorite. It would be Sloth, Gluttony, Lust at the bottom. Then the final four are really close, so don't read too much into this. I say that because I expect a little bit of controversy here, but next would be Greed, I think. That's where I think the controversy will be. Then Pride, then Envy, then Wrath. And let me explain that. I actually think that Greed's arc is my favorite arc, but the reason I put him at number four instead of higher is just because of his personality. Like his normal disposition, I find kind of grating. He had some amazing scenes, like I'll never forget that uh, that stairwell scene. But at certain points in the story, I feel like he sort of becomes a parody of himself. You know, like, ha ha ha, everyone's stupid but me, but secretly I love all of you, you know? He has that thing that I, I'm not a huge fan of where it's like, I'm going to express my love by whacking you over the head repeatedly. Pride, I think, is an amazing, amazing character. I mean, first of all, the design is perfect. And then hiding it in Salim, you know, this modest, humble little schoolboy beautiful stuff. And also I think that Pride has a lot more complexity than I think initially meets the eye. That scene with Al when he's trapped sort of is what changed my mind about, about him. He's got good in him, you know? He actually does on some level appreciate his mother. And that I think is set up for what Ed eventually does, sort of reincarnating him or whatever. So that I find really intriguing and kind of subtle and understated. Then Envy, because the amount of emotion I felt during that final Envy saga top notch. And the insights that come out of Envy are, are brilliant. The way they handle that with Ed is just there's, there's not much better. I don't really have many examples of more insightful moments. I'm actually tempted to bump Envy up to first. The reason I put Wrath at the top, and again, these are all very slim margins, right? Like, if you ask me tomorrow, I'd probably come up with a totally different ranking. I mean, he's just awesome from start to finish. He has some of the best scenes, both in terms of action and in terms of character development and conversations and subtleties of who he is. I felt the most intrigued by him for the duration of the show, and I had so many wild projections about where his story was going, Partly because I think he's one of the richest characters. And while almost none of my specific predictions for him came true, it was still satisfying in the way I was looking for, where he actually did have a resolution. You know, he did sort of end as this realized person, which is bizarre because he's so evil and we're supposed to hate him and he's done all these terrible things, but, you know, he died on his feet. I mean, not literally, but metaphorically speaking, he died a man. And there's something so powerful about that. For someone who was born into nothing, who was trained to be sort of this mindless follower, he ended being in control and being fully accepting of who he was in his own life. You know, I can't really explain it, but even in his death, I was forced to respect him, right? There was no moment that I can remember of wavering or weakness from that that strength that he embodies. I really feel like he is, on some level, an archetype, you know, like a traditional masculine or male archetype. Ultimate dad, right? But ultimate evil dad. <laughs> But there's some good in there too. There are qualities to aspire to in that. And he represents such a solid and clear form of those qualities. I feel affected by his character. Darren Storm asks, how did you take Greed's death? And would it have been good to keep him as the only living homunculi if he had not died? Could they have won without his actions? So I didn't rank Greed super highly in my list of homunculi, right? But I definitely think that his arc is one of the most satisfying and definitely the most heartwarming. And also I think in a way is maybe the most relevant to my life. You know, like I've talked about a lot in this series and also in this video. Greed, I think, is in a way, an answer to some of the existential questions of life about where do you go, what do you do? You gotta make sure that the greed is not the total thing, right? But the greed is sort of the compass to point you towards the thing, or it can be. I think that's that's one way to look at it. And I think Greed's arc represents that very well, where he goes towards wanting everything, you know, like being insatiable, but in the process, finding things of actual value that are, are more sustaining, more enduring than his external goals. It's a cliche. Right. And when you're watching that final scene where he's like, you know, this is all I really wanted, you know, it's a cliche, but it still hits. It hits well because it's real. That is true. You know, it's a cliche for a reason. That is actually the journey. And greed earns it. Most of the characters and not all the characters earn their earn their cliche moments. You know, I can imagine a scenario where he lived and I think it would have been fine. Him dying selfishly gives it a little more impact. But if we're asking, would it be safe for the world? Absolutely. I think that the show establishes pretty clearly that the homunculi have a chance for redemption. You know, they're they're human, ultimately, because father is human and they come from father. And we've seen them be able to learn and grow and think. Greed is probably the best example of that. And could they have won without his actions? I don't know if they would have been able to beat God had Greed not turned him into a pencil. 
Marge Morales asks, who is your favorite character? I know it's Armstrong. It's Armstrong. <laughs> Armstrong is probably my favorite, let's call him, non-main character. Although that hurts to say in a show like this just because they all feel kind of essential. But you know what I mean. Ed is my favorite protagonist. I know all these Ed answers are really cliche, but that's the truth. Favorite villain would be a toss up between Kimberly and Bradley. Favorite NPC, get a lamp guy, shout out to him. Would you consider reading volume 15 of the manga? So I mentioned I'm not really a big manga reader, but I would be willing to read one particular volume if there was something special about it. What is volume 15? It's not Nini Xander, is it? <laughs> Because, no, I will not read that. And do you plan on watching any more Full Metal Alchemist material? Well, I will watch the OVAs. I'm not sure if I'll make videos on them, but I gotta watch them. I gotta complete the journey. Stripey Kibble 65 asks, what did you think about the conclusion with Scar and his name? The name thing is sort of whatever to me, but one thing I really did like about that is I like what he said about how he died twice. That was sort of a, a very dramatic but poetic way of looking at it. He did, right? He did die. He was a radically different person at the end than he, he was at the beginning. And so that element of it I liked. I liked the recognition of change. Mikasa Ackerman asks, which episode is your favorite? We all know it's episode four. What's episode four? Oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Well, that was definitely an engrossing episode. I'm going to have to say episode 63, the, the finale episode. Because even though I enjoyed the show the whole way through, that ending was so perfect, it enhanced everything that came before it, if that makes sense. Shelby G asks, who did you agree with the most and or see yourself reflected in the most? Is it arrogant if I say Ed? I mean, he's the main character, so I feel like that's partly by design, right? But more than that, I think my personal philosophy leads me to admire him the most for his conclusions and his conviction. I'm open to the idea that this is an incomplete way of looking at it. But the older I get and the more I think about it, the more I think that values are king, ideals are king, and aiming only at results is extremely dangerous and problematic. I don't embody that with as much conviction as Ed does, and I probably never will, but I definitely admire that the most, I think. Sebastian Kohler asks, what is your POV on humanity striving to become godlike? Could it possibly harm or destroy humanity? So this is an endlessly complex topic. My first thought is that I think that there's good and bad in this at the same time. Like, I think it is in our nature to strive for things and to create and to try to improve our lot. And because that is our desire, it can't be a totally bad thing, right? Like that's how we were created. So if we're talking about God and we're thinking about God as the universe or the world or whatever, that is godlike in a way. Like in the show though, you have to be careful about becoming arrogant and thinking that you're outside of the system. And I think there's a lot of danger and harm that comes out of overestimating your own importance and your own ability to understand and your right to make decisions for others, if that makes sense. We will never be more than human, most likely. Um, at least in the foreseeable future. And when you think about it, why would you want to be more than human? I think anytime we look around and we don't at least on some level appreciate what we have to the extent that we would be willing to trade it for some other vague form of magic or whatever, it means there's probably a, a lack of full understanding about the gifts that, that we have. It's weird to even think about because what would becoming godlike even mean? You know, it would be becoming non-human. But I think like with father, the desire for that in the first place is, it's a very human desire and it's thought of in very human terms, right? What is it? It's power, influence, esteem. It's all things that we already want and already can achieve in some limited and maybe healthy way. So I understand the urge, but I think it's useful to refocus that on what actually is and what we actually are, ways in which it's actually aligned with with good for others and not based in arrogance and an overinflated sense of self-importance. And another thing I'll say about this is I've been thinking a lot recently about faith. You know, I think that faith sort of has a bad name, but when you really think about it, everybody relies on faith to live. We all have faith-based systems. There's sort of no way around it. I think we're wired for that. Ignoring that is dangerous. You know, ignoring the fact that faith is important creates a lot of room for bad faith to enter. I worry that if we don't have faith in humanity, or we don't have faith in values, or we don't have faith in a common set of principles, or we don't have faith in God, or whatever it is, you know, there's no right answer, but if we don't have faith in something that inspires us to do better and creates a guideline for action, where morality is not totally relative and everything can be justified in the name of like some desired result or whatever, then we will give our energy and faith to causes that actually might harm us. One very real example of this danger is people placing their faith totally in leadership or strong powers, right? That has a lot of potential to go wrong and has gone wrong in history. Or an over-reliance on, on science, you know, like thinking that you can mold humanity to your whim and that you can control the physical world or that you can predict and extrapolate results for a world of billions of people. And so, yeah, I do think there is tremendous danger to humanity. Maybe it's not directly trying to become God, but it's sort of the same arrogance that Father shows, thinking that we somehow can know better or have mastery over things and therefore that gives us a right to use other 
others for our own gain or to ignore the natural order or to try to shape the world in our image without respect for the consequences. It's very complicated. There's a lot. In a nutshell, I think, yes, father's arrogance, father's way of thinking does create a potential harm for humanity. And I think the way out of that is faith, but the right kind of faith. And I think that's partly what the show explores. Reeling Papa asks, if you were an alchemist, what do you think your alchemy name would be? Damn. Uh, the good alchemist. The philosopher alchemist? The alchemist who talks a lot. <laughs> the rambling alchemist. How about that? That fits better. Gay Ninja asks, favorite ship? Ed and Winry, but I feel kind of bad that I'm giving all these, you know, very normal Ed answers. So let me give you another one that's a little bit more out there. Izumi Sig is a great relationship. I admire the hell out of them. The fact that they're both formidable and have the utmost respect for each other, have each other's backs and compliment each other. That's a great relationship in my opinion. Austin Weeble asks, of all the symbols in the show, which would you get a tat of? I actually don't have any tattoos, but if I were to get one from the show, I would maybe do Ed's portal. That's very elaborate, but I like it a lot. Also, I think it has a lot larger significance in history than just the show, so that's cool. Alternatively, I would get a tattoo of Kimberly's face on my face. <laughs> so Dorian asks a question about human utopia and the dangers. Do I agree that you can't create a perfect society made up of imperfect individuals? I think that utopia is a dangerous thought, but I don't think it's the it's the goal necessarily or the dream. I mean, I think that for me, utopia is conceivable, but I think the danger lies in how do you get there? And if it's something based on using others as tools or one person or a small group of people seeing themselves as more important or elevated from other people and using that as a justification to destroy them or building a utopia based on something that's not sustainable or based on something that ignores human nature or is based on a lie or requires devastation to enact is going to fail. There are natural realities to our world and our world is extremely complex and it's, in my opinion, impossible to master. And so it will not come from top-down policy. It will not come from a wise king or something like that. I think it has to come from the combination of each individual reaching an ideal. And that is probably, you know, impossible to be realized, but I think that we can probably get a lot closer. But I think it starts internally. You know, it starts with the things that we can we can control healthily and that really is just our own beings, you know, our own thoughts and our own actions and being willing to seek the truth and being willing to sacrifice and being willing to find and embody virtue and not take shortcuts and not see other people as tools and dispense with the sins, you know, dispense with arrogance, pride, wrath, etc. That I think is what improves the world. And I think one of the messages of the show that I really like is that you can't force it. You know, you can't you can't be great and force the world to adopt that. But you do it anyway. You know, you do it anyway because that's the only way that anything ever happens. And if you do that, if you understand that that's your role, you know, like to just be the best person you can be, it sort of doesn't even matter so much anymore what other people are doing because you're already doing your part. And I think that's good enough in some way. There's an honor and a dignity in choosing to be what you think is the right way to be independent of results. You know, that's honor. And that's Ed. You know, that's one of the reasons why I respect him so much because he doesn't expect to change the entire world through his decisions. He just feels that it's right and he does it and he's uncompromising. But the funny thing about that is that it actually does have the desired effect because people see that. Ed becomes a point of strength that other people can generate their own strength from. And so I think the thesis of the show is it's both, right? It's like rather than try to shape the world artificially through power and knowledge and control or whatever, you become the best person you can be. You seek truth and you try to be as kind as possible while also being strong. You dispense with the sins in excess. And you doing that is probably not enough, but you doing that with others who are doing that, it will be an unstoppable force of its own. And it'll be a non-destructive unstoppable force because each person is really taking care of themselves and their community. And I don't think you can really go wrong that way. And you just hope that it extends out, you know, it extends out and through society and through the world. And for me, that's a noble thought. I take a lot of inspiration from that. You know, like, why do I need to think that I know better than other people or that, you know, other people don't get it and I get it. And so I should have power over others, you know? No, it's, there's one thing I know and one thing I can directly experience and that's my life. And I'll be as good as I can in that capacity. And I hope that other people will do the same. But even if they don't, I am satisfied because I have lived as an awake human being. You know, I feel like a man. And the chips will fall where they may. And if that costs me things, like if that costs me my life, well, then at least I died with my eyes open. And it's something nobody can ever take away from me. And so I've shifted the focus in that way. You know, you can be a self generating source of strength. And I think that is the way to utopia. But it's one of those weird Zen-like things where you have to detach from it. You have to detach from the outcome and focus on what you have and what you can do to get to the outcome. That was incredibly rambly. <laughs> I hope there was something useful in there, but that's how I feel about Utopia. Scrolling Tony asks, what is your ranking of the openings and endings? So I don't really have a ranking. I think I said that my favorite openings were the first and fourth. My favorite ending is definitely let it all out because there were times when I heard that where I let it all out. <laughs> Patrick Gensch asks, Alex Armstrong or Olivier Armstrong? Well, they're both awesome, but I gotta go Alex just because, have you seen the guy's muscles? I mean, come on. <laughs> 
Have you seen the orange sparkles and the mustache? He's just got it all. What else do you want in a character? But also he's really kind. And for me, the, the kindness makes me weigh him more heavily than Olivia Armstrong, who I respect the hell out of, don't get me wrong, but there's a ruthlessness to her that I feel is incomplete for what I'm looking for. Like I said, I think there's still political intrigue to be had in this world, and I think part of that will come from, from those values. Dumb Raven asks, excluding Nina and Hughes, which death do you think was the most tragic? Very wise to exclude those two. It's hard to find comparable categories. I think the Ishval and War, if that counts, was awful. That was brutal to watch, and the death of Scar's brother. For an individual character, I think I was maybe most impacted by Envy's death, just because, man, that was a tragic existence. That was just brutal. You know, I didn't feel sad necessarily. I just felt overwhelmed by the patheticness. You know, what a life. WatchVids asks, if you could live anywhere from the series, where would you? Well, judging by my actual life, I'd probably live in Shing. <laughs> Mason Bounds asks, feelings on how Ed and Al will live after the series ends. So this is wild theory, okay? I'm thinking about this more and more. I think there's another war coming. And I think Ed and Al play a very crucial role. And I think that this time around, after the war ends, some crucial themes are re-examined. Ideas about what's appropriate, about ruling, ideas about truth and transparency. And I think that after that war ends, the world experiences a long period of peace during Ed and Al's lifetime. <laughs> the more I think about it, the more I think there really could be a sequel. There are some unresolved threads for me. There's still a lot of danger, you know, especially with all those, uh, those Drachman spies lurking. Elita asks, who would win in an arm wrestling competition, Alex Armstrong or Izumi Curtis? Never, ever bet against Izumi Curtis. Just the sheer power of her will. <laughs> will destroy you. She will just gaze at Alex Armstrong. It's, it's over. He just loses his strength. Fateless32 asks, what is your opinion of the relationship between Hohenheim father and their children? I think it was pointed out to me that father's name and his impulse to create probably comes from Hohenheim, right? Because that's something Hohenheim wants. The irony, of course, is that he's terrible. He's the worst father and Hohenheim is, you know, at least comparably the best father. This is reading my own thing into it. It's not really in the show, but I think that there's something to be said for intent being very important in relationships. Hohenheim is not the best father in terms of his actions, but his kids end up being great just because Hohenheim's great, because Trisha's great, and because Hohenheim's intentions are pure and he's a good person and that eventually trickles down to his kids. Father is just awful. <laughs> and even though he's in many ways a lot more doting on his kids, he's a lot more active in their lives, they're terrible because they're reflections of him. And he does not care about them. You know, they're dispensable to him. And so that shapes them. And that's true in life too, right? Like, I don't think there's any, any you know, correct method of parenting. I think the important thing is that the intentions are good. You know, there are some, some people who they take out their worst qualities on their kids. You know, they're bitter or resentful or whatever. And kids will absorb that like a sponge and return that into the world. Richster21 asks, how would you rank the cuteness of Salim, Kid Alphonse, and Kid Edward? Weird to do this, but I'm gonna say Salim. Salim is just so cute. Have you seen his shorts? He's just a little like Pokemon trainer schoolboy. <laughs> and then and then Kid Alphonse and then Kid Edward. Clairvoyant asks, if you had a philosopher's stone, what would you do with it? I couldn't use it. I, I couldn't. I would I would preserve it in the hopes that maybe I could find a way to restore the people's souls. It's dark magic and nobody can convince me otherwise, and I wouldn't use it. Well, that's what I say. I mean, that's what I aspire to to be like. <laughs> In real life, I'd probably like Turn it into a car. <laughs> I don't know. Something really stupid like that. Joseph asks, if father's plan worked and he did successfully absorb God, what do you think would be his next step? Cry in loneliness. I think he's a human being. I think he's very sad, very lonely. And he's looking for things that he thinks will make him happy that will never truly make him happy. Greed had the right idea. Ryan Bix asks, how do you feel about the fact your parents named you after a man who takes his shirt off regularly? I feel honored. The value of my name skyrocketed for me after watching Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. <laughs> The only thing I regret is that my parents didn't give me orange sparkles or yellow sparkles or something. Andreas Adamik asks, I felt the show's dark tone shifted to something too positive around the Basque conflict. I get what you mean, and I found myself kind of surprised by that because the show starts off really dark. But the more I think about it, the more I think that's intentional because we and the characters enter into this dark world and it's really the worst world or like one of the worst worlds. The only worst world would be Attack on Titan. But that's a setup to explore an ideology. I think that setup is something like, okay, let's for a second, for the sake of argument, say that things are as bad as you can imagine. Here are all the worst elements of humanity and human actions. How do you live? How do you get out of that? How do you find meaning and value? Who do you want to be? And I think that the, the show, through the characters, answers that question in a satisfactory way. And that's why the show gets lighter, because they are carrying the world to a better place. And so by the end of the show, it's triumphant. And that to me feels not like plot armor or not, you know, like wishful thinking or anything like that, I think the characters earn it through blood, sweat, and tears. And I think that's part of what makes the show so satisfying. By the way, for all the comments about me taking off 420, it's just a coincidence. <laughs> Don't read too much into that. 420 is not not really my thing. Sorry to disappoint you. Which is not to say I don't have my, my other things. Have you guys seen Fruit Saga? 
I'll leave it at that. Hummum asks, how's your heart? Hurting too much? It is exploding with goodness and warmth and hope in humanity. One thing I've been working on a lot in my personal life, and the show has helped me tremendously with this, is creating a shield, an impenetrable shield of sorts, you might say, against cynicism. I think there have been periods, especially over the last year, where I found myself getting very cynical about people. And I've realized recently that's a huge mistake, that I have to keep my heart open and I have to have hope for people. And I have to treat everyone as if they have the potential to be great. I have to protect myself, of course, right? I have to not ignore the realities of the world, but I have to keep an open heart. And I can't allow myself to get jaded because nothing good comes out of that. And that feels good. It makes me feel strong. So my heart is is good. My heart's in a good place. All right, so that is the end of the Q&A. I apologize if I, if I didn't directly answer your question. I tried to answer one of every type of question at least. I'm sure I missed a whole bunch. There were hundreds and hundreds of questions. Thank you to everybody who left a question. These are some really great thought-provoking things. This is a lot of fun to do. Just doing this is making me appreciate the show more and realizing how much there is there thematically. It's always tough to do these Q&As because there, there's sort of a finality to it where now, you know, I've done the video and it's up. But the truth is, Whenever I finish a show like this, I think about it for, for months and months and months and I always come to new conclusions about it and I could easily do like a follow-up video in a year or whatever, but you know, it's just, where do you draw the line? You know, I could be doing, I could do a daily video like this. In summary, Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood is one of the most rewarding shows I ever watched. I'm deeply, deeply grateful to everybody who recommended this show to me and voted for it on the poll way back when. It was a great experience. You guys have never let me down yet. <laughs> I hope that continues. I will be announcing the next show very soon. Thank you to everybody who followed this reaction series. It's been truly mind-blowing. I think that the, uh, the interaction on these videos, the level of, of awareness and depth and exploration of these themes has sort of been unsurpassed. I get so much out of hearing your thoughts about it. I think that I wouldn't have appreciated the show as much without that. So thank you to everybody. Hope you guys enjoyed this this rather lengthy Q&A of me just sort of rambling. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. And who knows, maybe we'll revisit Full Metal Alchemist at some point in the future. All right, that's all for now. Love you guys always. And I'll see you very soon for Attack on Titan and the new show starting quite soon. <laughs>